This is the Bill Sang Podcast. My name is Bill Sang, and today we are going to be focusing in general on Christian entertainment, mostly because my family and I took a trip to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky this past weekend, and it was first class, absolutely incredible. This is exactly the vision I think Answers in Genesis had for their theme park, for the Ark Encounter, for the Creation Museum, and it is developing just absolutely incredibly as now it's not just the ark out there on this plot of land but also you have these other attractions on the same in the same area and it was just a great experience we're going to get into that here shortly i want to make it very clear when i talk about christian entertainment i know that some of you get cringy because you think about this outlandish worship experience that you might have at church and lots of times we say that well that's not worship that's just entertainment I can test. That is neither worship nor entertainment. That is what we call amusement because these engagements that we have at church where we just have this huge, I don't want to say worship band or anything like that, but you know what I'm talking about. These sort of pop group worship bands that are just out there trying to impress everybody. That is not worship. That is not entertainment. That is what we call amusement. And amusement is just a letting go of your mind. It's a thoughtless process. It's getting caught up in your emotions and having those tickled a little bit. Entertainment is engaging. Entertainment entertains the mind, so to speak. It makes you think. It makes you have to reflect upon what it is that is put before you, which is exactly why I like some of the more thought-provoking movies out there. I know my favorite movie is Godzilla, King of the Monsters. How can that be thought-provoking? I disagree. But I digress. We're talking about Christian entertainment. And because it's a very powerful force in our country right now. In fact, TV, television, used to be a reflection of American culture. Today, it is used to transform American culture. Television, a long time ago, used to be a celebration of American culture. Today... It is used to mock American culture. And so entertainment is a very powerful force. And I think it's important to talk about how to use it properly. I think that the Ark Encounter and Answers in Genesis have achieved that by creating a theme park that is starting to get to the point where it is going to one day rival Disney World. So I think that this is an absolutely wonderful thing. But let's talk about some of the cultural elements of entertainment today. You may have heard that Kanye West, once again, is being controversial. He was caught wearing a White Lives Matters shirt. A White Lives Matter shirt. I believe it was in Paris in some sort of a debut. I don't know a whole lot about it or exactly what's going on. I think it has something to do with the launch of a clothing line. He was out there with Candace Owens. And uh, also, he is proclaiming to be pro-life. What is happening with Kanye West? He's come a long way since the days when he was interrupting Taylor Swift on the stage of what would those be called, the Grammy Awards, and making a spectacle in his drunken stupor. He has apologized a lot about a lot of things. He sounds very sincere. Nonetheless, I'm still very skeptical and leery of him, as I know that lots of times people try to capitalize on a certain market that they can corner uh, for their own purposes. Having said that, why is it that the left is so afraid of Kanye West? It is because his prowess as an entertainment, as an entertainer in the African American commu- community. He has a lot of influence, and so These are people that could potentially be swung to vote in a different direction from the way they used to, where the African-American bloc is typically um, a guarantee lock for the Democratic Party. Well, there's been a huge shift in voting demographics, and now more and more African-Americans are starting to vote for Republicans. And I would say that's in no small part to people like Kanye West and Herschel Walker. So Kanye West is doing a great service to the American right. So is Candace Owens. And on top of that, thank you, man. I mean, this is something that is actually good 
for race relations also i mean people have been so frustrated about this whole thing uh let me give you an example right here i happen to come across a tweet by mark lamont hill mark lamont hill and who mark lamont hill is is he is a television personality he um is a contributor to various news shows and uh, programs on television, news stations, very prominent man, and I believe he is a professor at Temple University, maybe? I know it's in Philadelphia. I know that much. And Mark Lamont Hill, I'm going to make no bones about it. Mark Lamont Hill is a racist, period. How do I know that he's racist? Well, first of all, I've heard lots of the things that he has to say. Second of all, uh, he also is friends with Louis Farrakhan, the head of the Nation of Islam. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the Nation of Islam, the Nation of Islam literally believes that white people were created by the devil. And that uh, there's all sorts of stuff instead of that. And it's, it's very loony. It's very nutty. And, uh, but Mark Lamont Hill is apparently friends with Louis Farrakhan. And in his presence, again, he is the head of the Nation of Islam. And don't get that confused with mainstream Islam. I'm not talking about Muhammad and all that. In fact, Nation of Islam, barely anything to do with that. Pretty much, they almost never quote from the Quran. So don't think I'm talking about Islam. I'm talking about Nation of Islam. And uh, they, they literally believe that the white people on our planet need to be wiped out, need to be totally eliminated. And in the presence of Louis Farrakhan, Mark Lamont Hill happened to say, God is great. <laughs> so... Mark Lamont Hill, and that's not that's not the only reason why I say what I say about him. Here is his tweet about Kanye West. Kanye West's decision to wear a White Lives Matter shirt is disgusting, dangerous, and irresponsible. Some of y'all will rush to defend him. You should ask yourselves why. Well, let me tell you why, Mark Lamont Hill. It is because Kanye West is not a racist. Kanye West is is genuinely looking to heal race relationships in the United States. And so he is reaching across the aisle in order to, whether it's the aisle or not, I don't know. Nonetheless, he is reaching across the aisle to heal race relationships. And my goodness, I don't know if he's genuine or not, but in this respect, God bless you, Kanye West. I appreciate what you're doing, whether, again, it is genuine or if it is merely some sort of a stunt you're doing. But Nonetheless, it can't hurt relationships between the races. And I don't even like the word races. Ethnicities, uh, the peoples, we are all one race, the human race. So again, this is a very powerful moment because Kanye West being a, a prominent entertainer. Also inside of the world of entertainment, uh, Elon Musk is buying Twitter officially. I already did an episode on this, but he didn't buy Twitter back then. And as far as I know, I believe he is closing or closed the deal with it it is happening and it's going to have a huge cultural influence as people are projecting that freedom of speech will return to twitter something has been suppressed for an awful long time and i had a few other notes i wanted to make about the entertainment world right now um, yeah I, I guess i real will really quick um you do have the story about tom brady and uh gazelle bunkin and they are having a rocky time inside their relationship. And uh, it's sad, I think, because now Tom Brady is winding down in his NFL career. And all of a sudden, there's these family issues. And uh, this is something that, uh, that people should take note of. Just because you're prominent as, uh, I don't want to call Tom Brady an entertainer strictly. He is an athlete. But in that regard... He entertains millions of people every Sunday, and so he's he's a celebrity, and so is Gazelle Bundkin. And it goes to show that you can have all the fame, all the fortune, everything you possibly want in the world, and still not have everything to make you happy. So, um, very sad time. I hope that they're able to mend things. I hope that there is reconciliation that happens. Um, so just be praying for Tom Brady and Gazelle Bunkin and, and the people in your lives that you know that are struggling this way as well. So those are just quick notes. Now we're going to dive right into it. Christian entertainment. 
Everybody, I think that Christian entertainment really needs your support these days as we see places like Disney and Warner Brothers just going further and further and further into the depths of the depravity with the shows they are making, with the moves they are making, where characters that were once straight are now being converted into LGBTQ and sometimes they're transforming men into women, women into men, and just it's just absolute lunacy. Even actors and actresses uh, doing these very things for real, actually. Um, I'm not going to go, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not going to get into depth about it because I, once again, I like being able to do this podcast. I don't want it to get banned. But it is a dark world in mainstream entertainment, in the world of Hollywood. And so we need to put our buck behind Christian entertainment and uh, family friendly, wholesome entertainment. And one of the best places to be able to put uh, your money behind is Angel Studios. You will recognize the name Angel Studios because they are the ones who created The Chosen. And The Chosen is an absolutely incredible television show about the life of Jesus and his disciples. And it fills in the gaps with the Gospels uh, that are inside of the Bible because It doesn't tell you about every detail of Jesus' life or even those three years of ministry that he had before being crucified, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. Uh, Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that in relation to the Ark here shortly. But Angel Studios also has the Tuttle Twins and another movie called, uh, a documentary called The Riot and the Dance. It is a nature documentary. And unlike other nature nature documentaries, It gives glory to God, the creator, for everything that exists on planet Earth. So far, they've only done the first part of it, which is uh, life in the waters. Uh, I'm hoping to see a lot more from the Riot and the Dance in the future. Pure Flix. Pure Flix. This is a streaming service that has existed for some time now. It is a Christian streaming service, and it has a lot of popular Christian movies and shows. Um, And it rotates from time to time as far as what's on there, so I can't tell you exactly what they have on right now. But lots of times, seasonally appropriate movies. Like I remember during Easter time, they had The Passion of the Christ. I believe they had The Nativity Story during Christmas time. And uh, one of the things my family really enjoys is they actually do have Veggie Tales on there. Yes, they have Veggie Tales on Pure Flix, and I have to say, regardless of your opinions about the creators of VeggieTales, I think that the show is absolutely brilliant, and I still enjoy it as an adult, just about as much as what my children do, so uh, investing in those sorts of things. And I know that the stereotype on Christian entertainment has been that it's cheesy, is that it's not really that fun, and corny, and that it's not worth your time and your effort. Reality is, though, the truth is, is that Christian entertainment is going to start off that way, and it has gotten better over time. And the only way it could possibly get that good over time is through starting off with a bunch of cheesy, low-budget entertainment, so that way they can have the funding to make higher-quality entertainment, which is exactly why we need to be supporting this industry and these various streaming platforms and studios, what have you. Having said all that, that brings me to the Ark Encounter. Oh my goodness. The Ark Encounter is one of the most incredible attractions, not just inside of the Christian world, but any exhibit that you can imagine, at least inside of America. It is by far one of the most incredible. My wife asked me afterwards what my favorite thing about the Ark Encounter was, and I said, I don't know if anything can really rival Just going to the ark and seeing it just laid out on the land and getting an idea of how big it was and how big that their replica of the ark is. I mean, you have no idea the scope of this thing until you are there standing in front of it and watching people get their photo ops with it. It is just mind-blowing. Having said that, it has a lot to offer. They have a neat little zoo that's just uh, right behind the Ark. Uh, I got to see a real-life porcupine for the first time. That was cool. Got to go into a pen with kangaroos. That was something I've never done before. So we got pretty close to the kangaroos there. Um, 
they had other things that we didn't make it to, like a virtual rea reality studio. Um, we got to visit their gift centers, and I know there's one or two other things that we did not get to go to. Uh, their playground was really, really cool. They, they told us since we had kids, make sure to make it to the playground. It was very much worth it. The, and, and adults, you've got to ste step on the ground on the playground because it is squishy, it is comfortable, it feels very good on your feet. So I highly recommend uh, that if you happen to make your way down to Kentucky to visit the Ark. Uh, let's see here. Inside the Ark. You know, um, the inside of the Ark, there, there's been some changes to it. Not an awful lot, uh, but it's funny. My um, five-year-old, his whole goal was get, to get to the top of the Ark so he could go outside and, and play around on the playground. Um and it takes a while to get to the top, even if you just make it a straight shot. But let me give you kind of what to expect. And when you walk into the ark, so first of all, they take your picture, but also you hear like a storm. Uh, they, they're playing the recording of a storm to kind of set the mood that it's raining for 40 days, 40 nights, and now you are entering an inside of this ark that is meant to preserve your life. And so they do a great job of kind of building the mood to let you know there is judgment going on in the world as you're inside of this thing. And frankly, to me, it's creepy. It's a little bit creepy at first. In fact, there's even a room that is intentionally designed to be a little bit creepy for children uh, where they have some animals that are a little bit scarier and lit a certain way to make you jump a little bit. Uh, there was a little tunnel inside of this room as well. that I, It was more of like a hallway, I guess where I crept into the tunnel. I, well, my wife and my son, my nine-year-old, were walking through this hallway. I snuck up behind them through this tunnel and, and scared them. So that was pretty fun. So what do they have inside the ark? Well, first of all, they have some pretty real-life exhibits of what the animals would have been stored inside of. And so they have a bunch of cages and they show you how they would have disposed of their waste. They talk about how they could have fed them. And that's mostly on the lower level right there. As you go up, you still see some cages and some pens, but you start to see more displays as well, more information. And even a studio where they are, or a theater, I guess, where they are playing a movie. And currently, I believe it's called In the Days of Noah, but it's a contemporary movie is what it is. And then as you get up to the top floor, what you see is you see the living quarters, which I personally like the most because you see how it was that Noah and his family would have survived inside of this structure. And you get to see the plants, which I think are, you know, they're not real, I don't think, but nonetheless, they're beautiful to look at. You see the plants hanging from the ceiling <coughs> and uh, you, you get a very good idea of what life on the ark would have been like so lots of fun looking at that and something they added to it that they did not have before is a narrative they have now given names to the wives of noah's sons they, they gave a name to noah's wife and so they started to develop their own sort of story out of noah's ark and why is that well according to the bible it is possible that the story leading up to the launching of Noah's Ark was 125 years. There's a lot of history there that we do not have recorded. But they decided they're going to take some creative license. This ties into The Chosen a little bit because The Chosen actually did a similar thing. And I don't know which one got the idea from who. But with The Chosen, they filled in the gaps of the, lives, of, of the life of Jesus and his disciples. Inside of the ark, they are filling in the gaps of the lives of Noah and his family. And actually, I even bought some books. It's called The Remnant Trilogy, Noah. And uh, it looks like that, that is what those books are designed to do, to fill in the gaps leading up to the launching of the ark. And it looks like even through Noah's time, inside of the ark as well. So I'm looking very forward to being able to read those. But they've really just developed this sort of story, this narrative of the ark and the people that lived inside of it, uh, as well as probably even the animals that live inside of it. So there is a lot of culture going into the ark encounter. One of the most fun things to do at the ark, aside from the displays, exhibits, and everything, 
is the gift shops, the bookstore. And we actually bought a couple of books from the bookstore. And one of the ones that my children, my wife got, is a really neat book called The Answers Book for Kids. This one is volume seven. And we started reading through it, and I am impressed with the types of questions they have in here, the types of answers they have inside of it. And um, I'm just going to read to you a sampling of this because I thought this was really insightful. And I'm turning to page uh, 26 and 27. And uh, at, the, at the top of page 26, it says theory and reality. I don't know if you can see that. It's on this side right here. And then the question that is asked is, why do evolutionists keep believing when there is proof it isn't true? And for those of you that are unaware, yes, there is plenty of proof that evolution is not true. And I hold that the biblical account of the Bible is indeed true. And yet a lot of people still believe in evolution. And it gives a somewhat lengthy explanation, not super lengthy, you know, it's, it's pretty abbreviated, it's for children, so it's very easy for them to understand, and includes Bible verses even. At the top it says, take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then uh, at the bottom of the page, I think this is very insightful, it informs the reader that the unrighteous want to be deceived. God permitted them to be deluded by a lie, Unless they repent, they will be judged. And so I thought that was very insightful that it's telling children that the unrighteous want to be, be, to be deceived. And that begs the question, why is that that anybody would want to be deceived? Well, the Bible lays down a standard of living. Again, you remember how we talk about that people call Christians hypocrites. And that's because they fail to live up to the standard that they proclaim, that they preach, that they believe. And so they label them as hypocrites. But then the unrighteous, they want to continue living in sin the way they have been. And so instead of believing that there is a God with standards for their lives that defines what is right, what is wrong, how to live, how not to live, what how he designed the world so that things operate the best, people, instead of believing that, would rather choose that it's okay to do these things give you, that give you immediate gratification. And so I think that the answers book for kids is, is very well written in that regard to provide answers like that. Um, lots of things I could say on this topic of the answers book for kids. Answers in Genesis is doing a fantastic job at creating the Ark Encounter. I see that they definitely are focusing more so on, I mean, they, they've pretty much written and talked about every possible topic that you can write about and talk about in relation to the creation and evolution debate. They hold to the idea, bottom line, they hold to the idea that the Bible <coughs> is the inspired word of God. And therefore, the book of Genesis, the creation account, it's not something that's open to interpretation. Rather, the way that we should take the creation account inside of the Bible is we should read it and we should believe it. And that is what the Ark Encounter is about. That is what the Creation Museum is all about. And they understand the power of visuals in order to help you to grasp this. In fact, inside of the Ark, one of the questions that's oftentimes asked about Noah's Ark is, what about the dinosaurs? Did Noah just leave the dinosaurs off the Ark? I thought he was supposed to bring two of every kind. Well, first of all, it's not literally two of every kind. That's a general statement that's put out there. But there, of unclean animals like dinosaurs, it's possible they could have brought, multi, uh, I think it's either seven of each kind or seven pairs of each kind. And it's uh, disputed because of the language that's used in the original language as to which meaning it was, seven, uh, seven of the unclean kinds of animals or, wait, unclean? No, the clean kinds. I'm sorry, I got it all backwards. I'm sorry. Unclean animals, two of each kind. Clean ones were to be seven of each kind or seven pairs of each kind, uh, depending on how exactly you, you interpret, how, not you interpret, how you translate the original language. So I'm going to get caught in my words there. So what about the dinosaurs? Well, 
the reality is, is that if the Bible is true, which I believe it is, that they would have brought dinosaurs onto the ark. And inside of the ark encounter, they show you how that could have been accomplished. First of all, you would not take the biggest of all the dinosaurs. You would not take full-grown adult dinosaurs onto the ark unless that is something that is reasonable to do. But instead, they showed that you would take the younger, the smaller, the ones that are at the beginning of their life cycle, not at the ends of their life cycle, so that when they get off the ark, they can reproduce. And of course, if you're any way familiar with answers in Genesis and just creationism in general, the general belief is that the dinosaurs went on to become the dragons of legend, which to me, that makes perfect sense, makes a lot more sense than the idea that dinosaurs evolved into birds. In fact, the way I like to put it is that according to the evolutionary model that birds evolved into, I'm sorry, according to the evolutionary model, dinosaurs evolved into birds. And so these huge reptiles evolved into something that has nothing to do with their family of creature, where according to the creationist, the biblical worldview, what happened is that dragons, the, the name dragon evolved into the word dinosaur. What is a dragon? It's a terrible lizard. What is a dinosaur? It's a terrible lizard. So it's not the creature that's evolving, it's our language that's evolving. And just memory of the dinosaurs, memory of dragons has kind of uh, started to fade in time, even though in some dictionaries a long time ago, it did refer to dragons as very rare creatures. And uh, just so happens that it's very likely that their kind of animal is now extinct inside of the world. Um, and that's up for debate, I suppose. But it's, it seems very likely that that is the reality, that they're probably all extinct at this time. So, um, so they provide these sorts of answers, which is exactly why it's called Answers in Genesis to begin with. And I hope this doesn't sound like I'm just simply um, trumpeting Answers in Genesis and trying to... Uh, uh, I, I am supporting them. I am somebody who is trying to make it clear that they are a good ministry and that they are providing the type of Christian entertainment that we really need. And once again, going back to the actual meaning of the word entertainment not making you turn off your brain and being susceptible to be driven by your emotions, but rather having you engage the Bible with reasoning, with thought, with creativity. And that's what I love about the ark, oh, the creativity that goes behind it. The fact that they are creating this story about the family of Noah so that you can feel like that you know them better. And of course, be careful Ultimately, those elements, the artistic elements, are not God-inspired. The biblical account is what's God-inspired. But the creative artistic accounts are intended to direct you toward the biblical account so that you can get to know God's word better and grow closer to God as a result. So that's my experience with the Ark Encounter. I encourage you and your families to make a trip down to Kentucky. Even if you don't have children, it would be a fun experience for adults that are more experienced in their lifetimes. Uh, that it is a great visit. One of those sort of bucket list things, if you will, if you have not been there yet. Um, so make it down to the Ark Encounter in Kentucky and uh, support Christian entertainment like Angel Studios, Pure Flix, Answers in Genesis, Answers.tv, and there's other studios and platforms as well that you can support that uh, also are promoting the same message of the cross as these other places are. So I'd like to thank you for joining me for this edition of the Bill Sang Podcast. My name is Bill Sang. We are shooting for 1,000 subscribers on Rumble and 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. Please also check out Buzzsprout and the different platforms that it filters the podcast out to, funnels the podcast out to, such as iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, and so on. Uh, thank you so much for being able to support me in this endeavor and to be a part of this. I, I just keep, continue to pray this becomes something that is uh, inspiring to many people, that helps a lot of people out. And I want people to grow to know God better and Jesus Christ better. So continue to join with me in this quest to do so. Once again, my name is Bill Sang. This is the Bill Sang Podcast. Have a great day.